I'm sure you will have a, a, a truly amazing day today and um, probably to set you on your path, I want to talk to you about something we talk a lot about uh, at Singularity University which we call exponential technologies and what this means for you as a, uh, as a, as a person, as a business, as someone who's a leader in, in your uh, respective fields. Um, what I'm trying to do is, uh, we have 25 minutes and I will give you uh, basically what we're doing in a week-long executive program uh, and now in 25 minutes. Um, we typically charge $14,000 for that, so you get that for free. Uh, and really, it's what um, uh, the, the pieces I want to talk to you about is what we call exponential technologies. But before we get there, um, I want to take a step back in time to uh, a quote which Alan Kay said in 1971. So Alan Kay, for those of you who don't know Alan, uh, is one of the, the leading researchers or was one of the leading researchers at an organization called Xerox Park, which is um, about 30-ish miles away from here. I'm um, still located there in Palo Alto, in the foothills of Palo Alto. When Xer what Xerox Park did was um, really remarkable, and we talk a little bit about this in a second, um, but more remarkably is the mindset um, Alan Kay and Xerox Park had, which is they went out and said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I, I hold this dearly and uh, uh, see this as a universal truth. If, if you want to create a particular future for yourself, for your children, for the people you work with, it, the onus is on you to create this future. Otherwise, it will just happen to you. So Alan Kay said this in 1971. And of way of introducing Alan, um, this is Alan Kay in 2008. And what Alan holds up here is a computer called the Dynabook. What's remarkable about this thing is a couple of things. First of all, so this is 2008. This is one year before Apple introduced the iPad. Um, Alan Kay holds up a computer, as you can see, a lot like an iPad-like computer. It's a very thin computer. It's defined as a folio computer, like a book, basically. Um, you see it has a, a touchscreen display, has a little keyboard. It looks a little bit like the very first generation Kindles. So this is one year before Apple introduced the iPad. So this is inventing the future. But what's more remarkable about this is, um, so this is 2008, let's go back in time to 1972. In 1972, Alan Kay actually invented this computer. So in 1972, Alan Kay wrote a, um, a white paper, a book basically, a 30-page document um, on this computer he called the Dynabook. Now, in 1972, there was no way on hell that you could even possibly build this computer because in that time, computers were roomfuls of electronics. A lot of the electronics we he wanted to have in this computer, including touchscreen displays, for example, didn't even exist. What Alan Kay, though, could do is he could see where the trends in computing go by looking at the past and extrapolate those out into the future and determine that at one point in the future, and granted, it took him 40 years to get to this point. But at one point in the future, you can actually create this computer. What's most remarkable about this document is, and this is the thing which really blows my mind is, so you go, you flip through this document and it describes this computer and it's literally the iPad. Like the thing Steve Jobs gave to the world in 2009 at Moscone Center just down the road from here. What's really remarkable about this is the use case he anticipates for this computer. The use case is, and this, this document is littered with references to it, is kids using this computer as an educational and entertainment device. Now, if you look today who's using your iPad, if you bought an iPad and you have kids, I can guarantee you, you are not using the iPad. <laughs> so it's really interesting like how you, how you can actually describe the future and take this as the, as the theme which will carry us through the next 20 minutes. The last 40-ish years have seen a lot of incremental change uh, in terms of technology and the way technology affects our lives outside of the internet. The internet clearly is like probably the biggest gift uh, we as, as humans gave ourselves, uh, at least in, in the context we're currently in. We are at the brink and probably already in a phase of the world where the, the change we're seeing is rapid and dramatic and won't be incremental anymore. And I wanna show you how this pans out in the world. And the basis for this is, and I mentioned earlier to you, this, this notion of exponential technology. It's kind of a weird word. It's a little bit of a made up word we came up with at Singularity University. But really what we're talking about is these exponential trends. Exponential trends are the easiest form to explain them is you double, typically you double every time period. So you stack up these trends which have this like weird hockey stick curve. So they start out very slowly and then they go very, very steep, very quickly. 
The most important and probably best known exponential trend is Moore's law. So here in Silicon Valley, Gordon Moore, who's one of the co-founders of Intel, um, predicted 50 years ago, pretty much exactly 50 years ago, that the number of transistors on a um, square inch of an integrated circuit will double every two years. This is the reason why when you take out your iPhone today, uh, so someone just took a picture of me with their iPhone, your device, your iPhone device, and this is not an exaggeration, has more compute power for the $800 you pay for it than NASA had total to send the man on the moon. Not just like a computer, all of NASA's compute power is now in your pocket and then some, $800. This is the reason, this is a classic exponential trend. Now there's something interesting happening and we're calling this the linear exponential deception. Let me explain this. So technology moves exponentially. We see this in computers, but we see this in many, many other technology in, um, areas as well. So you see it in, uh, today you see it in artificial intelligence, robotics, synthetic biology, energy systems, um, solar power, yada, yada, yada. Now we as humans have grown up over the last 150,000 years in a world which is linear. Like the seasons come and go, you know, harvest comes and go. Every winter the sable-toothed tiger tries to kill us. So really our world has evolved in a linear fashion. So our thinking, our intuitive thinking has evolved in a linear fashion. And let me show you how this plays out. We're calling this the linear exponential deception. Imagine you take 30 steps. So I take 30 steps linearly, one after the other. 30 steps is, as someone who grew up in Germany, 30 meters. Um, if you're an imperial, you're at 30 yards, roughly. That's easy to understand. I have a very intuitive sense how far that is, probably from here to the end of the room. I also have a very intuitive sense how far half of that is, for example. Now imagine you take 30 exponential steps. So every step is twice as far as the step you did before. Now I know that you can all pull out your computers and you can even probably do this in your head uh, and you can do the math on this, but ask yourself like what is the intuitive answer you would give to me which comes to your head, like pops into your head. Now typically if I ask a room, this is a little bit too big a room to like do this interactively, but if I ask a room, like the typical answer is, and you can check this with yourself, is if you're brave, you say it's a mile. Now in reality it's 25 times around the planet. It's a billion meters. So you go from 30 meters to 25 times just because you're moving from a linear to an exponential trend. Now let me show you how this plays out in the world. There's something called information growth. Um, this is data which uh, Eric Schmidt and the Wendy Schmidt Foundation, so the, Eric Schmidt was the uh, former CEO of Google, um, they were interested in information, obviously because it's Google, it, uh, it's a topic for them. And they determined that if you were to take all the information mankind has ever produced until the year 2003, so literally you take the cave drawings our ancestors did, you take the library of Alexandria, you take the great works of Beethoven, etc., 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 and you were to digitize them. This is a number which is, comes up as information. It's about five exabytes. It's a very big number. Now, the same amount of information, amount, not quality, it's quantity, okay? The same amount of information we produced in 2010 in roughly two days. All of mankind's information compressed down in two days. Now, in 2013, we already produced this in 10 minutes. I can guarantee you that today, by the end of every single sentence, I probably, we as humans, produce the same amount of information we produced since the beginning of dawn. This is a classic exponential trend. Now, it goes the other way around as well. You look at cost. So this is a downward exponential trend. You take the cost as an example of DNA sequencing. The first time we decoded the full human genome was part of the Human Genome Project, completed in 1999, took us seven years. If you take all the costs which went into this, it's about a $3 billion endeavor. Incredible feat for mankind to take the human genome, decode it, seven years worth of work. Now in 2006, we did this for a couple of million dollars. $10 million took us a couple of months. So we're already going from like orders of magnitude downwards. Last year, a company out of San Francisco called Illumina built a machine which looks like a really big photocopier. And they're decoding a full human genome, the full string of a human genome, in a few hours for $1,000. So within 15 years, you go from something which only nation states can possibly even think about doing 
to something you can actually do in a hospital today. Now you speak to our experts, and this is the so what here, you speak to our experts who are in genomics, and you ask them, so what do we make out of this? They will tell you that price will come down in the next 10-ish years to pennies. Sequencing the human genome will be free. Now, what do you do with this? Simple. One thing is, we literally have a picture, uh, one of our faculty has a picture, of a toilet bowl. Every time you flush the toilet, the toilet will sequence the, the genome and gives you a full health report. Because you get it for free. Why wouldn't you? Now, here's the scary side of technology. Because te technology always goes in kind of weird ways where it's like it's good and it's bad and technology doesn't really care. But here's the scary side. You're currently shedding cells. Like you're losing hair fo follicles, you're losing skin cells. The moment you all leave this room, BSR will hoover up this room <laughs> and create a full genomic fingerprint of every single person in this room. And you can't do anything about it. True story, the President of the United States, when he travels to rogue states, the Secret Service is actually hoovering up behind him. It's a true story. So this is what happens on, on exponential trends. Now there's an interesting thing. We talked a little bit about this idea of like we are thinking, we are, as humans, we're really hardwired to think linearly. So now if you map linear versus exponential trends and you look at this curve, there's like three really interesting points. The first is, because exponential trends start out so slowly, there's a point where we want technology to be here and in reality it's here. And this is what is called disappointment. This is where we are dismissing technology. This is when you look at Google Glass, classic example. You look at Google Glass and you say, wow, it's $1,500, way too expensive. Battery life is terrible. Functionality is really not that great. And oh, by the way, you look like a dog wearing it. <laughs> so you're dismissing it, right? But then something interesting comes. You come to this point where Steve Jobs gets on stage and shows the world for the very first time the iPhone. And you're looking at your Nokia phone and you're like, this thing is not a phone anymore, <laughs> right? You've got the crossover of these lines. This is the point when like everything changes. And then you come into a world where you come into chaos and amazement. This is where you cannot keep up with the change anymore. So take mobile phones. Kenya's um, cell phone penetration, smartphone penetration today is 7%. So they have about 90-ish percent uh, cell phone penetration. 7% of those are smartphones. In three years, that number is going to shoot up to 90%. In three years, all of Kenya is on the internet. Now, we talked to, for example, Barclays Bank, which is a big bank down in, in uh, Kenya. They will tell you that if they are not on mobile phones, banking on mobile phones in three years, they're gone. They're just disappearing as a bank. So this is what these, the power of these trends. Now, the challenge is big corporations, uh, big organizations typically stay on this, this linear path. Nokia being a really interesting and good example, Kodak being the other one. If you stay there, this is your path to doom because you become irrelevant. You become displaced by someone else. Let me show you this in another graph. This, is, uh, this graph needs a little bit of explanation. It's my favorite graph of all times. <laughs> Uh, this comes from Ray Kurzweil, who's one of our founders. He's a, uh, one of the leading engineers uh, at Google. He's uh, one of the, if not the, uh, most authoritative person to talk about artificial intelligence in the world. So what Ray did was, there's an argument to be made to say, well, these exponential trends are actually not exponential. What they do is they're S-curves. They flatten out. So take, for example, uh, Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is true for 50 years, but we're now coming to a point where the distance between transistors is about six to seven nanometers. So the smallest distance you currently produce, um, produced by Intel, by the way, is six to seven nanometers. If you go to about two to three nanometers, physics don't work anymore because you've got electrons jumping between the, the transistors. So Moore's law will flatten out. Now he was interested in like, what does this actually mean? So what he did was he came up with a different calculation. He said, well, if we look at something, you can only count transistors for the time there are transistors, obviously. So he came up with a different calculation saying, if we count how many calculations can I produce per second if I were to spend $1,000 of that year's time? So it's kind of like a, a crude approximation for compute power. And then he went for a 110-year period through the different technologies. And what you see is this is a logarithmic graph, so that's the reason why you're not seeing it as an exponential but as a linear um, graph. What, what you see is that 
Effectively, what Moore's law stipulates is true for 110 years. And the reason for that is simple. Because what happens with technology is you've got these S curves, but they stack on top of each other and create a perfect exponential. So in this case, you start with something like mechanical computing. Mechanical computing got replaced by tubes. Tubes got replaced by transistors. Transistors got replaced by inter integrated circuits. Integrated circuits will get replaced by quantum computing or biocomputing. We don't know yet which another paradigm is coming, but we see that these trends stay stable. Here's the reason why I love this graph. First of all, it shows that these trends are stable over time, over long periods of time. The second is, and now you can do some fun stuff with this graph. The second is, if you take the delta between the lowest and the highest point in the graph, it's 10 to the power of 15, that's the delta. Uh, that happens, according to Wikipedia, to be the amount of ants living on the planet. <laughs> fun tidbit. More importantly, if you take the smallest point on this curve, um, which is at 10 to the power of minus five, and you would draw this, and it's one inch high, the highest point on the curve, which is in the year 2010-ish or so, that highest point would be 66,000 times to the moon. This gives you an idea of like what the increment in change is we have had in compute power, in, in raw compute power. Now, here's the really crazy part about this thing. If you believe, there's a big if here, if you believe this to be true into the future, you can actually extrapolate the moment because you can draw the curve, the moment when you will have a computer which has the raw compute power of the human brain, which will happen in the year 2029. So in the next 15 years, we will see a computer which has as much compute power as the human brain. Now, more interestingly, you can actually extrapolate this even further out. Now we'll be coming into the realm of like crazy, but follow me along. In the year 2060, so a year I probably will not see anymore, but like my children will, we will have a computer which has the raw compute power of every single human on the planet. Single machine, all of the human planet's compute power. Now, let me give you another way to look at this. Um, in 1903, humans um, did the first powered flight. This is obviously the Wright brothers, uh, Kitty Hawk, an incredible, incredible feat of mankind. In 1969, humans did, for the very first time, fly supersonic in a commercial setting. So this is the uh, Concorde. So the thing which you need to wrap your head around, like for me, is this like every time I tell that story, it's like I get goosebumps because it's crazy if you think about that there was a human, there were humans in 1969 who have not seen man fly at all who went and could fly from Amsterdam or Paris to New York in three and a half hours. Now, some people say we're going backwards on flying, but that's a, that's a whole different discussion. So we're calling this the rate of change. If you were to index all the technology change, and this is a little bit a murky uh, index, so bear with me, it's not like super scientific, but if you were to take all the technology change we've seen between 1900 and 1970, so not just flying, but uh, cars and television and uh, communications, et cetera, et cetera, you were to index this, we see the same amount of change happening between 1970 and 2000. So 70 years of change now compressed down into 30 years, compressed down into 10 years, 2010 to, uh, 2000 to 2010, compressed down to four years. 70 years of change we're now doing in four years, and there's no holding off on it because now we have machines doing a lot of the discovery work for us. This is, by the way, the reason why when you pop up, when you like lift your head out of like your daily work, you tell yourself, oh my God, I cannot keep up with what's happening. This is the sole reason for that. Now let me give you another framework to think about this. And this comes from Peter Diamandis, who's uh, our other co-founder. This is called the six Ds of disruption. It's a really nice framework to think about how this change pans out in the world. And I wanna walk you through uh, on this example. So this gentleman uh, is the inventor of the digital camera. He happens to work at a company called Kodak. Ironically, the company which just got killed by the digital camera. And he holds up the very first digital camera. So what's remarkable about this camera is like, beside the fact that it's like this really weird big contraption, uh, it saves the images on a cassette tape, which is kind of cute. Uh, <laughs> but more importantly, so this camera had 0 0.01 megapixels. So it was terrible, obviously. 
So here's how this plans out. This is the six Ds of disruption. The first D stipulates that anything and everything you can digitize becomes digitized. And this is very clearly true for cameras, but it's clearly true for all kinds of media. But it's also true, for example, your, your health information. Like your genome is about three gigabytes of data, but it's data, it's GTA Cs. And we see this everywhere. So anything and everything which can become digitized becomes digitized, and once it's digitized, it's on this exponential curve. These trends start out being deceptive. They start out being really, really, really slow. So here's the example of what panned out, and this is a true story about Kodak. So this gentleman goes to Kodak, top brass at Kodak, says like, I've got this amazing thing. We can take pictures and they are digital. You don't need to put them on film anymore. And the thing has 0.01 megapixels. You can imagine how bad the quality is. So the Kodak people say, dude, like this doesn't work for us. Like film will always be better. Now, digital cameras are on a perfect exponential trend. So they went from 0.01, the next year he had 0.02, the next year he had 0.04, the next year he had 0.08, by which time Kodak said, this is not gonna work, we're gonna kill it. Because all they could see is the zero in the beginning. Now these trends then become disruptive. Disruptive is, in the terms of digital cameras, was the moment when you had two megapixels. I very distinctly remember the time I bought my first camera with two megapixels because two megapixels was good enough to get like a little paper print. It was good enough to like look at the picture on a screen and in a good enough resolution. So they become dis disruptive. Because this stuff is digital, it starts to become dematerialized. So what was a $500 Canon ELF camera, which I bought, now becomes a little thing which is part of my cell phone. I don't even buy a camera anymore. A good friend of mine builds radios in Germany, like physical big radios. They're 299 euros, beautifully designed, wood casting, amazing. The functionality of that thing is a free app on my iPhone. His business got totally dematerialized. It doesn't exist anymore. You will not buy the radio unless you buy the radio as a piece of furniture. You demonetize stuff. So once it becomes um, digitized, and becomes dematerialized, you suck the money out of the system. So you demonetize, and if, uh, eventually you start democratizing it. So this is when Kenya, like seven, uh, three years down the line, Kenya is like all on the internet because they uh, use phones which are $25. Let me give you one last, um, uh, one last view of that particular world, and this is called abundance. So technology en enables us to do something really interesting, which is we can create, we live in a world of perceived scarcity. Um, and technology allows us to get out of, out of that perceived scarcity. So here's the story. Napoleon III holds this true story. Napoleon III hosts the King of Siam. The King of Siam is this massively reverent guest. So what they do is they throw this really big party, uh, a banquet. Napoleon gives everyone silver plates. He himself take golden plates. And because the king of Siam is the most reverent guest of all times, he gives him plates made out of the most expensive material at the time, which is aluminum. Because aluminum is really, really, really hard to produce. It's, cu it's caught up in a material called bauxite, which is basically rock. Now, here's the irony. 20 years after this dinner happened, technology is invented to do what is called electrolysis, where you use electric energy to like break out the aluminum out of bauxite. Now bauxite, and this is the irony, is 7% of the Earth's crust. It's the most abundant metal on the planet. But technology allows us to use this abundance metal. Uh, metal. Now, if you think about like energy, for example, we fight wars over energy because we consider energy being a scarce resource. Like there's a, they, we fight wars over oil. Yet the sun produces so much energy we, there's no way on hell we can actually even use up this energy. And we're currently seeing, when you look at solar, for example, we're currently seeing those trends happening. Um, you take something like water. California is in a deep water crisis. Ironically, we are surrounded by the biggest body of water on the planet, which is the Pacific Ocean. We need technology to allow us to get to this abundance. Um, or you take information. The President of the United States, Bill Clinton, went on stage at uh, an event at the Clinton Global Initiative talking about abundance, telling the audience that on your phone today, you have access to more information than Bill Clinton had 20 years ago when he was president of the most powerful nation in the world, in the United States. That's abundance. We are living in a world of abundance if we use technology to get there. 
So here's your so what. If you're not taking anything out of this other than two things, the first is really open your mind and your hearts and your ideas to a world which is a technology-driven world which moves on an exponential curve. You can actually predict these trends fairly well into the near-term future at least, the next couple of years, and can build for this future. Something which will cost you $2,000 today will cost you $20 in three years' time. A sensor which costs you $200,000 today, the LiDAR sensors on Google self-driving car, when Google started those cars, was $40,000. The same sensor, about eight years later, is $50. That's the reason why we can now build self-driving cars, because these sensors are super, super cheap. So this is happening, exponential trends. The second is, free yourself from the world of scarcity. Like, allow yourself to think in an abundance world. Like, what if, if you live in a world where there is ample, ample um, opportunity? I'll leave you with the last quote. Um, this is from um, Albert Einstein, who said that we shall require a substantially manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. I hold this clear and dear because I believe that there's a way for us to rethink the way we perceive the world and we operate in the world, uh, which will allow us to create a world which is uh, significantly better than the world we're living in. With that, I wish you a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, I'll have a panel later. Come to my panel if you are interested in uh, exploring this a little bit further. Um, enjoy your day. Thank you.